Testing, one, two, three. Good evening. Good evening. If y'all could please sit down, we're going to get this thing kicked off. Boy, everybody got quiet, too. You usually don't get both of those together. Can y'all hear me okay? Everybody can hear me okay in the back? Everybody can hear me? Yes? All right. So you guys know who I am. I'm your parish president, Jason Bajron, and I want to thank you guys for coming out to our inaugural town hall. Uh, when I was running for office, I talked about being transparent and giving our residents a voice, and this is how we do it, right? Uh, this is our first one, so those little things might work and might not work, but we're going to learn every time and get better. And so I want to first off by thanking, start off by thanking everybody that's here, because I believe time's our most valuable resource, and I appreciate you giving me some of yours. And so I got a guy over here making hand signals behind. I don't know if he wants to be still second or what. Anyway. So again, thank you all for being here. Uh, we got it slated for an hour, but I'm going to be here and answer questions till we're done. And so uh, again, I thank you. We have these forms that are on this table over here that have your name, address, and the issue. I've already talked to a couple of you that have shared your issues with me. Um, you know, one of the things I used to talk about with my employees and with my customers, with my businesses, was that you know we may make mistakes, but we're going to make it right. And that's what's important to me is that uh, I'd rather make the wrong decision four times than not make any decision at all. And so, you know, we got, we're working to give our, and that's what I've been doing since I've been in office. For the first six months is to give our employees the tools they need so that they can thrive in their jobs and set them up with the success with those tools. And that's what we've been working on. We've been trying to make sure what systems we have in place and what's, what things we need to improve upon. And again, having the conversations about what's going well and what's not going well with our employees and then what do they want to do to fix it? And that's what we spent the first six months of my administration doing. So uh, we also have some emergency preparedness books also over here. So please grab, take them all. They're for you. So I have a presentation. It takes about 30 minutes. And we have a choice. And this is a crowd democracy decision. We either go through the presentation first or we just jump into answering questions. A presentation is about recovery, resiliency, and quality of life. And so if you guys want to hear, see and hear this first and then go into questions, we can do that. Would y'all like to see the presentation? Yes. Yes? yes? All right. Cool. All right. So you can see our new logo. I want to make sure everybody understands what that is about. I'm going to start there. So I always feel like something like the parish seal is important. And it's even, we even have an ordinance that says if you want to use the parish seal, you have to come to me for approval. And I feel like the, spill, the seal should be special. It should be something that is on buildings and letterheads and, and is official business. But when it comes to marketing our parish, I don't believe the seal should be used for that. And that's what we did. We created a logo that we could put on anything and everything that people can use for, for promoting our parish anywhere and everywhere. And then what we do is we work off of a brand which is one of the things I do for a living in my businesses is to help companies brand, help organizations brand. And when you look at the blue and the green that's on there, and it's not because this is a white copy, but that means the water and the, and the land, right? The two things, the good earth of what Terrible Parish means is what helped us develop that logo to give us a fresh new look. And you say, well, why'd you do that? Well, when I look at the rankings of the parishes in the state of Louisiana, all the ones that are doing the best all did that. The ones that are not, they're at the bottom, where we were in a lot of categories. So it's one of the things that I've done it. I've helped businesses be successful, organizations be successful. Let's give it a shot and see if that's something that could inject a little positivity, something that's something different. And it's, it's that conversation of right, insanity, right? Doing the same thing and expecting a different result. So we'll jump into the presentation. Feel free to ask questions as we go through. I'm very informal. And so I don't mind answering questions as we go through this presentation. So we've had a lot of post Ida stuff. We're right here on the cusp of our three-year anniversary of Ida, right? And we're all still feeling it. I know people are still dealing with insurance issues and, you know, government towers ourselves, our first and second floor is still not repaired, and we're hoping to have that done in September so we can get some of our parish employees back into the government tower. But we have an air base, that, uh, fire station, that is pending FEMA, review, FEMA final review uh, to get that built out. 
uh, our Public Works South Campus facility is having some work done on it around September 24th. And, you know, that's a conversation about the parish should clean up its stuff. That's some funding we've been wanting to get to make sure we can help finish cleaning up that stuff. And this is a list of those kind of items. Uh, we have different kind of pump station repairs, whether it's covers of engines and everything else to make sure those uh, pump stations are running optimal capacity. Uh, September 24th, that's going to be finished also. Our Civic Center, you've seen we're replacing a lot of the poles on the outside. We had some roof repairs. We have one of the bleachers we're going to change out. We're expecting all that work to be finished February 2025. The Dumas Auditorium work was completed J July 22nd. The coroner's office, uh, which is right by the municipal auditorium, is expected to be completed September 24. And the Old Main Library, where the sheriff's office used to be, is also uh, getting completed this month. Our Folk Life Center, I talked about Government Tower. Uh, municipal Auditorium, we had most of the ceiling tiles, not all the ceiling tiles have been changed out on the inside due to water that seeped in from the storm. Uh, but we're going to continue some smaller projects through the end of the year and people will start to be able to use it. A women's criminal justice building, when you look at the jail, there's two buildings. The one to the left had a lot of damage. That's, I think, about 160, 180 beds uh, that are not being used right now. That will be once that work is completed in September of 24. Uh, a digester tank at our North Treatment Plant. Uh, it's supposed to be October 24. And we are 90% complete on a health unit that we're going to build next to the Tesh Action Clinic on Tunnel Boulevard uh, with anticipated construction to begin in fall of 24. So that's kind of the rebuilding and, and, and things we've been doing kind of post item. And then we start talking about recovery. So we are waiting on $117 million of CDBGDR funding that comes from the state, from the Office of Community Development. We had to go through and submit plans. And so we have 20, I think it's 29 projects. We had a first allocation we submitted in January, second allocation we submitted in March. And then as we were answering questions on those plans, they said, you know what, we're gonna change everything. We're gonna put it all in one program and all your applications are due in November, on November 30th. So they said, our plans look good. These are great ideas for projects, but we want more detail. And so we're actually in the process of start, starting to submit these projects, these applications, as we get them complete, to have all of them turned in for the November 30th deadline. And just a few to cover, when you look at water redundancy and water quality in East Terrebonne, uh, that's a water line going, from the, uh, going across intercoastal from water plant to make sure that we have good water supply on this side of the parish. We're gonna be doing some small business grants, some items to support the seafood industry, stuff to activate the bayou, a small business incubator that not only incubates businesses but processes, and parish-wide weather stations. And that's just a few of the projects to give you guys an idea. And as we do this, as we turn in an application and we get approved, we're gonna get some fundings in some situations we're gonna give. We're gonna say here's an application to fill out to get those, that funding. And that's to address both some economic development projects and affect low to moderate income uh, families across our parish. Any questions on the CDBGDR, $117 million? Yeah, yes, sir. I've got a question. What, uh, what kind of, uh, there's guidelines, I'm sure, of how you can spend this stuff. I mean, we're, we're going to be controlled by the federal government about the way we spend this money. So that money is being run through OCD, Office of Community Development, at the state level. And their, their priorities are low to moderate income, economic development, and resiliency. And so with that, we gave a plan that says, here's 29 projects, and this is what we're thinking about doing. And they said, this looks good. We need more information. So, you know, opportunities for our residents, rebuilding post-Ida, and doing things that make sure the residents with the most need have some issues addressed, right? And, we, and, uh, and there's a website where we can look at that stuff? So if you go to tpcg.org slash recovery, it has what we've done pretty much to date. And again, as we go through these applications, we're gonna turn an application in, they're gonna say yay and nay, or we need questions answered, or everything looks good. You know, hopefully I'd like to get some of these funds, if not most of these funds, hopefully I'm thinking end of the year, if we're lucky. But one thing I like to share through this process, so you look at Lake Charles, who has the hurricanes a year before us. So we, we reach out to them and say, hey, you know, give us some pointers, what do you think, can you help us out? And they go, we're in the same place you guys are. So this project, how the state and federal government handled housing and funding after Ida is different than what they've done before. 
So when it comes to housing, they're dealing through what's called Louisiana Housing Corporation, and they're going to try to find developers to work on housing. All this CDBG, CDBGDR money, we, can, we can't do housing with it. They've already said housing money is over here, recovery money is over here. And so as we go through and, and again, work with them and say, hey, this is what we want to do with this, they might come back and say, no, you can't do this project. Well, we got a couple alternate projects that we might better put in place, or we might better take that money and divide it up to some other projects. And so as we go through this process with the state, we learn more every day. But so far, everything's looking positive that what we're trying to do, they're going to support. And hopefully we get some of that funding by the end of this year. Answer your question? All right. Uh, so moving on to what I like to talk about. Not that I like to talk about it, but when I talk about it, I call it a housing crisis, right? We still have over 500 families or so not living in their homes. And that's a problem to me, right? And it's whether it's somebody that has a camper in front of their house that still fight with insurance to get the money or some of the campers that are located in places like Carriage Grove or some campers that are in some of the, the sites that we've built. Um, one of the things that we're really working to do, you know, we had about 250, 300 families in the uh, Bayou Towers and about, I want to say it's about 120 or so complexes at Center Circle. Those people still don't have a place to live. And so I've been working to hold the Housing Authority accountable because I want to make sure do we know how many people are coming back? And do we know what the opportunity looks like for those people to get back into their homes three years after the storm? And so, you know, there's a process they're going through with HUD and with FEMA. Uh, we've gotten uh, some Congress people involved, trying to put, put pressure where we need to put pressure to get some buildings torn down and get a plan for what rebuilding looks like for those communities along with everybody else that doesn't have uh, a home to live in, right? Uh, we're about to reopen the beautiful Beginning Center. That is a family uh, day center, a place where uh, families could get help. It's a gap that we've had in our services. We're getting ready to do that. And then when it comes to housing units, so Parkwood Place, where I talked about uh, Office Community, I mean, uh, Louisiana Housing Corporation, that's 90 units of mixed duplexes of family, single family units off of East Street. West Tunnel Loft, which is about 40 rental units for families. Imperial Terrace Apartments, which is about 120 units, and then Bontier 3, uh, which is on Main Street across the feed store, which is 55 units for senior housing. And so we have some things in the work. We have some things coming. Uh, it's never soon enough. It's never, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to push this forward every day, uh, but we are working towards addressing our housing crisis. How, how does the um, homeless people fit into this uh, scenario? Bring the mic to her. What's that? I'm sorry. The homeless people. How so, do they fit into the scenario? so what I've learned through this process with homeless, uh, one of the things that I worked on before becoming parish president was getting a downtown business association created to get business owners to have a voice about what things go on downtown. And one of the things we identified early on was a homeless problem, and there was conversations around. Do we have ordinances? Do we have laws? Like, what, what can we do there to learn that our laws that we have, ordinances we have, are unconstitutional? And so it's okay, now we've had that conversation. It gets back to that conversation about the gaps and understanding why is somebody homeless? Is it mental health? Is it economic disadvantage? Is it drugs? Is it whatever it is? And so one thing I give credit to our housing department, and I don't think Kelly's with us here tonight, is that most of the time when I've had a conversation with someone about somebody being homeless, in most cases, we have information on them. We know who they are. We understand if they do want help or don't want help, right? But through that process, we've also worked with Bayou Community Foundation. The parish participated in a summit, behavioral summit, to have those exact conversations. Who is homeless? Why are they homeless? What gaps do we have? How do we fill those gaps? And as we work through it, part of that in housing is there's, a, there's some housing vouchers, there's a housing program they go through. And so we're definitely doing everything we can to identify who is it? Why do they have the issue? What help they need? And if there are gaps in that process, which I think there are, I believe there are, how do we fill those gaps? And I do believe that's something we address regionally, because historically what's happened is Terrebonne Parish has had the issue, created the resource, the resource gets overwhelmed because it's the only resource in the region, and then the resource falls by the wayside. And so try to work on these things at a regional level is something that I think we can do a better job of. And Bidey Community Foundation is a funding resource that can actually help us do that because they work on a regional level. And so I can tell you that everybody that is not in their home 
there is a case at some level, state and or federal, that the parish government is involved with understanding to make sure we try to get them the need. But unfortunately, there are some people out there that don't want help. And it's like, what do you do in those situations? And so far, I haven't had many people tell us how we fix that, but that's something we're definitely trying to do. You good? All right. Yes, sir. A lot of homes that's being torn down and sin deemed to be condemned that uh, actually can be restored and the people can have places to stay instead of being homeless. So I got that a little bit later in my slide. You mind, you mind if I cover that when I get there, if you don't mind? Okay. All right, anybody else? All right. Economic development. I got a little bit on this. I wanted to talk about it because I think it is important as we talk about our recovery and we talk about you know, providing opportunities for our residents. And so we were fortunate to be awarded a Waterline Grant uh, at the intersection of Martin Luther King and Enterprise Drive, not Enterprise Drive, Westside Boulevard, I'm sorry. Um, there hadn't been any development there because there is no water access. So we got a water access grant from EDA that's gonna be able to provide some water, tie in some areas that can provide for more development along that area. So that's something that I wanted to celebrate a win. That's something that Tita helped us out with uh, and working with our uh, Consolidated Water Works, we, we partnered up on this deal and we were able to get a grant that was out there. You know, it's not money we're taking away from anywhere else. A grant that was available that we could work on getting some economic development going on Martin Luther King in that area. So, and I know Terrible General is talking about building a wellness center right there. That's also something that helped drive this project. And so we, we all partnered together to get this funding coming in. Uh, next, uh, insurance reform. So. I understand some people thought insurance commissioner is not here. Unfortunately, all you get is me. But we have conversations with the insurance commissioner on a regular basis. In fact, the guy that runs my HR risk management department, it was on Tim Temple's transition team for insurance. And that's Mr. Ryan Page. He couldn't be with us tonight. But we are having plenty of conversations. I feel like this is a topic that we're approaching from multiple angles, whether we're dealing with homeowners insurance or FEMA and flood maps and everything else. We're hitting it with everything we have and trying to think of different ways to get this accomplished. Uh, we're gonna have a new congressman for our area, already having conversations with, with him about what we can do to you know, maybe address FEMA differently and re get some things resolved. And so uh, we're working to, whenever, so FEMA's requirement is to do flood maps every 10 years. The last ones that were completed had data up until 2018. Since 2018, we've gotten a lot of work done when it comes to levees and pumps and everything else that we do both at the levy district level, through CPRA, through all different organizations and, and corporate partners and Ducks Unlimited and everybody else, but none of that's recognized. And so what we're working on right now is trying to give them data that can be entered in the models that show we have a levy here, that we had 11,000 homes flood for this hurricane and we had 11 homes flood for this hurricane. And so that's one step that we're working on. Again, we're talking about working with our state insurance commissioner, having a conversation. So in insurance, there's an underwriter. So it's basically got insurance that pays for the insurance. We're working on getting those people that help decide rates down here to look at. This is what we built. Come stand on this. Come touch that to understand the work that we've done from taxing ourselves and not waiting on the federal government. This is what we've done, and it's built to the standards that eventually is gonna be the heights we need, but hey, we're doing eight foot here and 10 foot there and 12 foot, and for those that may or may not know, you build a levee to 15 foot for it to settle, and then you come back up and build it at 15 foot again, right? And, and eventually, it stays at 15 foot, and that's, that just unfortunately costs money, but the Corps of Engineers is now involved. They're working on the last gap from Miners Canal to Marmons Ridge, and getting that constructed to where there's a full levy everywhere, right? And then we got to work on getting those levees higher and getting the gaps closed. And you look at how much work that's been done. We just did the groundbreaking on the lock structure on the Homeland Navigational Canal. And the reason why that is important is because we can't close that gate, the Bubba Dove Gate, unless we have a named storm and an expected two-foot storm surge. And what's interesting is we had a storm 700 miles away, Alberto, that was a named storm with a not expected two foot surge that the gate had to be leave, left open, which resulted in water in people's yards, right? That project's about three to four years. It's $310 million. Once that's done, we shouldn't have the issue we had with the water issue 
So even though we've spent a lot of money and we've got a lot of work done with people that came way before me, we still have some gaps and holes that we have to fill. And hopefully in the next three or four years, we're in a different position than we are now. And every year we're making progress on that. And it's a, it is us working with Levy District. The parish has some, in some kind of fallback levies. The Levy District's got levies. That's part of the Morganza to the golf system. Water control structures and pumps and, and everything else. And so uh, we are working with the Levy District to make sure we're on the same page. Because between the both of us, we are now in the business of moving and managing water. And that's the conversation I've had since I've been in office is let, let's make sure that we're having that conversation. And so um, we're also, uh, like I said, showcasing flood, flood protection. And the, uh, we're also in a lawsuit with FEMA regarding restraining 2.0. And we actually got kicked out of that lawsuit with, along with 40 other parishes. And we had to actually come back and prove the parish has properties that are dealing with the National Flood Protection System pro uh, Program that you know this we have skin in the game because we have properties that are part of this lawsuit and so that's the process that's going on there any questions on insurance before i move on no you good so we do actually it's just i want to be specific in that particular gate that we couldn't close because of Alberto. And I say we, Levy District, right? They, right. They, they go through their checklist, but we do have conversations about things being open and things being closed and what does that mean? And look, one thing I'll make sure everybody understands, and I'm gonna say this and I hope, you know, not trying to get too basic, but Ida came in and changed the landscape, right? We lost over, and I might transpose the numbers, it's either 106 or 160 square miles of land for Ida. That changed the way the water flows. That changed where our weaknesses are. And so as we go through each storm, it's which, which angle is it coming in from? Where is the high pressure? Where is the low pressure? And when you look at Alberto, it was almost the perfect scenario of a south wind, a storm that rose the, the Gulf waters. You know, you think back to Rita that passed 500 miles underneath us and flooded homes in Terrible Parish, right? So there is that for every structure. And there is, they call them, uh, tide whispers. I mean, there, there's conversations about, you know, we've had people ask us, why can't we open the levee system, lock systems, and let water lilies out? Well, at that time, when that question was asked, it was two foot higher on the outside than it was on the inside. So if we open up that system to let the lilies out, they're not going out, water's coming in. And so I do think they take that job very seriously, and we're working on having sensors and data points and people going out and checking physical, watching the flow, we're doing that at every point that water comes in and goes out of this parish to make sure that we're making the best decisions. I gotta give it to Mr. Laura Lee Rat in the back back here. He's my chief administrative officer. I've watched this guy travel to pump stations and have conversations going, you know, what does it mean if we keep the water at this height? And somebody would say, well, we have water on this road normally. And he goes to the road and he's like, there's no water on this road. So we wanna make sure with the ever changing conditions that the data we have is correct and that we're taking all that data and all that information and all the experience of all the hardworking people that have been working for the parish, giving them the tools they need to make the best decision with the information that we maybe didn't have two years ago and information we're gonna have in the future we didn't have before, so yes. Any other questions? And I know insurance is important. They're too high, you know, I don't know if everybody knows the legislature passed 26 bills to help work on insurance and to help lower rates from a homeowner's perspective, right? Then is the flood part where a lot of stuff that we can get involved with, because as a parish, we could, we could do more on the flood side than we can on the homeowner side, right? The homeowners is really more state, but I'm having conversations. I'll tell you guys, my aunt, who is 75 years old, is selling her house and moving in with her ex-mother-in-law because she can't afford insurance. So we're all affected by it, right? I'm, I pay the same electric bill inside the city that everybody else does. So if the rate goes up, I pay it also. And so I, we want you to know that we're with you. We're on your side. It's not us versus you. It's us working together to help make sure we, we resolve the pain points that we are exactly feeling ourselves. Yeah. You had a question? I think we all in this area believe that the Morganza uh, lock system is going to be a, a great thing, right? But they got a lot of people that make their living and also enjoy recreational fishing in, inside the Morganza system. Uh, right now, where it stands, I think the uh, trigger to close the, the locks, right, is I think at 1.4 feet. One of the concerns of a lot of fishermen is going to be that, uh, like right now, we're going through a moon phase. Uh, we got a two-foot tide range. 
So I don't think people realize that in the future, uh, that lock system is going to be completely closed all the way from one end all the way to the other end, uh, even during the average uh, tide cycle. Um, and I know it's a federal structure, but what kind of uh, weight can the, uh, can the parish, because uh, it is in our parish, right, uh, to try to have that, 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 that trigger point to close it higher than 1.4 feet? So I'll, I'll talk home and navigational canal, because I don't know if that's where you are, but I'll just say that. And I might mistakenly say sometime and call that a lock, but to, right now that's actually a floodgate, a.k.a. water control structure, right? So it can't close unless certain conditions are in place. When you look at the fact that when the lock is finished, that gate's always going to be closed, and that lock system's going to let vessels come and go every day, all day. I want to say it's about a 120-foot opening. And so in the situations where we have floodgates that we have to close and we can't necessarily pump things out or allow things in and out, that's where you start seeing these locks pop up more often that let vessel traffic pass no matter how high or how low it is on the inside and the outside. So I hope that answers your question and, and helps everybody else. So, and I need a chance to introduce, if I don't mind real quick, I would like to introduce, we have some parish employees out here, and I was gonna wait till the end in case some of them have to leave. But uh, going around, I did introduce Mr. Noah Lee Red, who is my chief administrative officer. That position used to be called the parish manager, but I'm a business guy, so I like things being C this, and you know, CEO, CFO, CAO. Speaking of CAO and CFO, so Ms. Candace Malden is my CFO. She's the lady that tells me whether I could spend or not spend money, <laughs> but great job. Robbie Lee, who is my CCO, my Chief Communications Officer. We didn't have that department or that group whenever I took office. That's something that's newly created. And if you're seeing a lot more information on Facebook and in other places and more places to come, it's directly related to the work that we've done in that department. Um, coming around, I got Ms. Caroline Eshte, who is our public, one of our main public records people. Uh, Travis Terrio, Chief of Police in the back back there. Leilani Adams, she besides the lady in the, the Bayou shirt, who's my wife, are the two ladies that control my life and my schedule. Leilani's my office manager. Mr. Corey Henry, who's our fire, fire uh, police, I'm sorry, I can't even talk, our fire department chief uh, back there. Uh, coming forward, Mr. Mark Black, sitting in the corner. He's in charge of coastal zone management. Mr. Clay Nakan, who is our solid waste and levy vegetation guy, because we have vegetation in two different areas. We have vegetation underneath public works, which is drainage, and then we have vegetation on medians and uh, uh, levees, which is clay. Coming around, I have Mr. Uh, we, call him, we call him Jimothy Window, but it's Jim Window. Quality of life, I'm gonna talk about that in a little while. That used to be TPR, and coming across. Who did I miss? Did I miss anybody? Earl Hughes, he's our emergency operations guy. Uh, when it comes to the hurricane, he's the guy that keeps our butts in, in line and out of trouble. And so uh, he's uh, one more. Anybody else? Who am I missing? I said Corey, right? Corey Henry? I almost called him police chief. All right. Anybody else? Huh? Ryan and Russell. These are two of our communications uh, guys right here. Our, our, I said communications, IT, marketing. They're, they're all in the communications now. I want to thank... Ms. Kim Chauvin, who is a councilwoman for being here. Mr. Dirk Gidger, who used to be a councilman, is also here. I'll make sure I got a councilman, Carly Hart, Carl Harding, who's also a council member. And I thank him for being here also. And HTV, I want to thank them for also covering this. And it's live streaming right now, so it sees what you get. All right, any other questions on insurance before we move forward? And please, if you have questions, like I said, we got the form. We are bringing our insurance commissioner down. You know, I know he's coming Tuesday for something, but we're going to bring him down for uh, once we get these, these groups down that can help give better pricing uh, and help us adjust that, but having really an insurance summit, I would like to call it. So, all right, next slide. Power plant, a lot of questions about the power plant. So the power plant was damaged during the storm very badly uh, to the point that FEMA says we're going to have to rebuild it. Um, right now, we're expected total cost is about $170 million. Of that 170, we have 65 obligated. FEMA has said, yes, you're getting 65, and we're thinking about you getting the other 105. We have a pretty good feeling it's gonna happen. Uh, we have temporary generators running there. Without those temporary generators, so I'll say this first. People may not know, but from Morgan City to New Orleans, we have a 200 megawatt pocket of energy requirement. 
Of that 200 megawatts, 80 was produced by the Homa Generation Station. Now it's aged, it wasn't efficient energy, so it wasn't always called upon, but FEMA identified it was called upon enough for us to put 20 megawatts of temporary generation at the power plant. That's those trailers that you see lined up. There were some other generators before that, but once they reach their useful life, they have to be replaced. So it's a very good possibility before we get our generation station built, which we probably would expect to be about four or five years, we're gonna have other generators get swapped out. But those generators are there to help with load. And without those generators running, of which FEMA is paying for, there was possibility we'd have rolling blackouts. So FEMA said, we feel it's important that you have your own generation. We have 20 megawatts, and we're going through the process to get our 80 megawatts uh, solution rebuilt. You know, we all know what construction, what kind of time that kind of stuff takes, and engineering and everything that comes with it. But we are going down the road of what it's gonna look like. It's gonna be a more efficient system. Uh, for those that may or may not know, power and gas are the two areas that actually generate revenue for the parish. Everything else is not revenue generating. We're gonna have some opportunities with the new technology to sell that energy out into the system, right? You don't, you don't produce power these days for you to use. You produce power for the system and then in situations where, like for example, we have one feeder that comes in through energy right now. We're in the process of trying to get a second feeder. But if that feeder goes down, we have an 80 megawatt system, it could support our parish. And that's the failover that it provides. And another reason why FEMA is saying they're gonna give us the funding to rebuild it. And so uh, we're expected, we, we have that going on, temporary generators. Uh, we're gonna have the expansion, the, the opportunity for expansion, because FEMA says you had 80 megawatts, we're gonna give you 80 megawatts. We have the opportunity to expand in the area we have to go more than that and partner with other entities to maybe do 100 watts or 120 megawatts down the line, but we've got to build what we had before, but it's gonna run more efficient than what we had. It's gonna be gas combustion engine, natural gas combustion engines. Uh, and then at the, at the same time, you know, we've had some issues, we had some power outages here and there. We have a system wide line repair that anticipated completion is January 2025, and if I'm not mistaken, it's somewhere between 140 and 180 things that need to be repaired throughout our power that's provided. The power line systems and transfer stations and all that stuff has, is gonna be repaired by January 2025. So some of the issues we've been dealing with is stuff that we need to repair post Ida that we're just getting the project and the funding for, and so I expect our system to run better and be better as we get those things completed. Any questions on power, power plant? No, all right. Whitney Bank Building, so that's a building that was being purchased as I was coming into office. We got that building for a third the cost of the tower that I actually work out of every day, so we got a great price on it. We have regular office tenants that rent space in this building that have leases in place. And the goal with that, those rental incomes coming in, <clears throat> excuse me, is to pay off that building in about six years, right? So it is gonna be a quasi government and office space building for regular offices. We've had some of those uh, occupied since January. We relocated TITA, TITA used to be in the tower. We relocated TITA to the Windy Bank building and they're gonna be right next to the uh, Fletcher business incubator that's gonna be spun up as soon as we get the funding for that from CDBGDR. Uh, the DA's office, we're working at building out the second floor. Uh, they got some time, it's gonna be before they rebuild their Kersman's building. Uh, so they're going to work out of that second floor, and we're going to work to get that second floor that was completely demolished. I don't know if you know the building across the street with the bricks that collapsed the roof. Those bricks were being tossed at 150 miles an hour through three-quarter inch glass on that second floor, which is why all that second floor has to be redone. Uh, and again, I talked about Fletcher with the business incubator along with some possible classes, and we're going to have some HPD offices out there also. So that's going to be, uh, we're excited about that. I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, to locate some people again closer together, some efficiencies that come with that, we're gonna take advantage of. And as we go through moving around the Whitney Bank building and other buildings throughout the parish, you know, we're looking at who's, who's the best fit for what for where. And for example, you know, we're, we're responsible for the jail, and that, ha that they have a jail, but the sheriff's office runs it. We're responsible for giving the DA a place. We're responsible for giving clerk court a place. You know, so as we have these conversations about who is what and what is more efficient to work better, we're moving people around. We're, we might free up some buildings. We might put some buildings on the market. You know, we're, we're going to look at all that and make sure that none of that goes to waste, that we get the best spot for the people that need the services or can work together efficiently to get stuff done. So any questions on the Windy Bank building before I move on? No? All right. 
And also, I do appreciate the fact, too, with the Whitney Bank building, uh, that it's going to bring more people, foot traffic downtown, which I think is important across our parish. Accountability is something we uh, talked about a while ago. We currently have 500 properties in the condemnation process. And I've received those phone calls of people saying, why, why is this being condemned? What about that, right? And sometimes it's that simple. And I've had this conversation and brought nuisance abatement in or planning and zoning in and said, why are you guys condemning it? And what do you need to not condemn it? And sometimes it's as simple as a building permit. So if you've got a property that's been sitting there for six months to a year that doesn't have a building permit for repair, is somebody going to do something with it? At the end of the day, by definition, by ordinance, it is blighted, right? So we have a million dollars that we're going to go through through the entire process. We've gone through some of that money already. Uh, we use American Rescue Recovery Funds. I think we're somewhere in the $600,000 area now. When that money's out, it's out, right? When you have a condemnation after that, we've got to figure out how we pay for it, right? But at the end of the day, we are condemning and demolishing properties that don't belong to the parish at an expense of taxpayer dollars, right? Or even, even through American Rescue Plan, that might have come from federal, that's taxpayer dollars, right? So what's important to me is that we hold our business owners, our property owners accountable. And so we're looking at doing some ordinance updates that make people, when you have the same issue over and over again, we gotta go inspect it, we gotta go cut the grass, we gotta go do all that stuff. We're doing that in the parish every day. And Sometimes by the time we get out there, the grass got cut. So we had a person that made a trip that maybe couldn't have had to made a trip, but nobody let us know the grass got cut. And sometimes we got to cut the grass. And then you go down the list of things, trash, junk, abandoned vehicles. You go down the list of things that we continually have repeat offenders that I feel like we need to hold accountable. And so when I look at the fact that we don't want to condemn it, right? We don't want to be in the condemnation business. But right now we have 500 properties and we get new properties added on a regular basis. And so, you know, part of this conversation is you, you bring it to us, we're going to take care of it. But man, if you can help us not get, help it not get brought to us, if, if you as residents of Terrible Parish can help hold our other property owners accountable, I mean, it's a conversation that says we probably all know somebody that might have or might not have a, a property that I mean, needs to be condemned or is blight, right? So it may not be completely condemnable but it's still blight. There's still grass that's this tall or this tall, right? And I'm a firm believer, when you point a finger at somebody, you got three pointing back at you. And so the same thing that we're working to do will hold our residents accountable. I've written letters to the DA, to the housing authority going, this property is condemned and needs to be torn down, which they've been able to use to give to FEMA and saying, the parish president is telling us it's time for this building to come down, right? But unfortunately, because of FEMA, depending on who you work with, and who you talk to, some of them say, if you tear that building down, I can't do the 50% conversation of whether or not we're going to rebuild it, and I can't guarantee you're going to get money for it. So if, it's not been, if it hadn't been torn down now, there's a very good possibility that somebody on the government side hired enough saying, you can't tear that down yet. And so, look, we, we're working on it. We're fighting on it. That's why I talk about these nuisance, I mean, these ordinance updates with the nuisance and abatement stacking if you have one property that continually has properties. Or if you have a property owner that owns a dozen properties that have problems, I think the more you're costing us money, the more you should pay for it, right? And look, we, de we demo properties. Most of the time, we don't get that money back. And if we get that money back, we get a percentage of it back because it'll go through a ser sheriff tax sale. Those, those liens and everything, all that lien stuff gets on it. But sometimes we don't get that money. The Paris has a lot of properties in our possession because somebody didn't even buy it on a tax sale. And so... Uh, there's opportunities for residents to buy those properties and get them back into the tax market and, and have it where it's a, uh, a good member of society from a property perspective, right? Panhandling and vacancy, I talked about that being unconstitutional. A lot of municipalities are working from an anti-camping uh, anti opportunity. And they take a sip of water. Um, again, if, if something's un unconstitutional, I want to get it out of the ordinance set up and put something in that we can use. So if you have somebody on property, and it's private property, and we deal with this all the time with Travis with uh, HPD, if the building owner doesn't say they're trespassing, there's nothing we can do. And that's why we're trying to do some things differently because you know, there's people that sleep in four, uh, foyers and, and under buildings or maybe have a tent somewhere. There's nothing we can do about that right now based on our current ordinances, so we're working to change that. 
uh, recreation accountability, you know, a master plan, more teeth where uh, I want the presidents of every reg district to serve on a board that can hold other reg districts accountable, but not just from maybe not doing something, it's how can I help you? How can we share resources? Really working together. You know, we have some reg districts that are really gold standards in our regions. And I, my question is, why can't all of them be that way, right? What do we gotta do to get our reg districts to work together to where every district is that gold standard? I believe every person, no matter where they live, and I, and I used to talk recreation, right? I talk recreation now because it's still called a rec district. But we renamed that quality of life, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But I believe every resident, no matter where you live, no matter how old you are, should have every opportunity to the best quality of life. And I think that's where that comes into play. And then things that we could do to get more foot traffic in our parishes, in our parish, uh, whether it's food trucks downtown or different things that we can do to make sure that this, things just look better, right? It's, I feel like when you deal with the insurance issues and you deal with the econ economic issues and you drive down that road and it messes up your tire, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And I don't know if everybody heard about the uh, state of emergency I did for St. Charles and Tunnel to get the state rolling, to get that fixed, because we were going to fix it and we showed up to fix it and they said, we'll have it fixed by Saturday. We're going to do that every time we can. I, we have a quarterly meeting with DOTD and we have conversations about this doesn't look good, that don't look good. What can we do to help you? If you can't get to it, we wanna go fix it. And we're ready to go fix it. And we've had those conversations where we cut a few things now that the state used to, and we just got out of a meeting yesterday where we're gonna look at cutting more things that we used to. And if we do that, maybe you get a better opportunity to fix the road. But I wanna, what I'm working to do is create partnerships and relationships with everybody, whether it be a DOTD, whether it's Wildlife Fisheries, Coast Guard, Corps of Engineers, what, I wanna work together. Right? I'm not going to go in a meeting and chew butt because that's probably all they get. What can I do? What can I do to help you? What's not going well and how can I help resolve it is what we're really working to do with all organizations inside and outside of the parish. Any questions on accountability? Can I answer your question? Yeah, good question. Pretty much. Yes, they are. So, no, so what happens is we get a person to go take a picture, that person's not making those decisions. That gets kicked up to other people that have been doing this a long time and doing a great job. And you know, even if you go through the whole process, the conversation, if you hadn't heard me say it yet, you give me an address, you give me a picture, you give me a contact phone number, let's have the conversation because maybe, maybe there's a miscommunication, maybe we can do better, right? Maybe there's something a resident can or can't do so at the end of the day, <clears throat> we want to make sure, and I know even the, you know, these go to the council members, I've seen them delay and say, we're going to give somebody an opportunity. And so, you know, we're going to, we're going to try to do everything we can. Again, if we condemn a property and we demolish it, it's coming out of our money that we don't want to do in the first place, but we have a responsibility as a parish to address blight. And so if there's a specific instance, we have a piece of paper, let's get that address. Let's run it through the chain to make sure that, uh, Again, we want to do everything we can to help our residents and give them a hand up and, and, and not be a hindrance, right? That's my number one goal when I became parish president is for government not to be a hindrance, right? I don't want to get in the way. I want to make sure we give a hand up when we can and give information so that our residents and our business owners can make informed decisions. So. If you have a building permit, it shouldn't be condemned in the first place. But what also has to happen is that if your building permit expires, you got to get an extension. And maybe that conversation hadn't happened yet. I don't know specifically until we look at it, but let's have that conversation. Let's figure out what we can do to make sure you have all the information you need and we have all the information that we need. All right, thank you. Next, quality of life rebranding. So I talked about it earlier. I talked about how, uh, you know, reg district show recreation quality of life and so I've been involved in TPR I've coached football baseball volleyball my kids I played it you know because I've been on just about every field in the parish and through that uh, when I feel like you talk about recreation I feel like everybody thinks kids right and I go back to that conversation no matter where you live no matter how old you are you should have better access to quality of life and TPR has had a turbulent history and so we decided to say we're gonna rename that quality of life um, we then turned around and made three sub-departments. 
So what was TPR, football, baseball, basketball, that is now athletics and leisure. Uh, what was Main Street, the home, uh, home of downtown, HDDC, I'm drawing a blank on what that stands for right now, nonprofits, volunteerism and outreach. You know, so a lot of that we have Ms. Ann Pico who's done a lot with Main Street and downtown and all. I uh, basically said, okay, we have this of what it is now. We're gonna call that culture enrichment and then we're gonna expand that out to the entire parish. And so that's where the culture enrichment part comes from. And then we have venues, venues and destinations. So the person that dealt with downtown used to handle the municipal auditorium and Dumas. Well now, you go, you're gonna go scheduling in one place. So whether it's municipal, Dumas, the Civic Center, the Sportsplex, all those different facilities are scheduled in one place. That's now called venues and destinations. It also includes a downtown marina. It includes some parks that the parish maintains and take care of, and we're working on getting more of those every day. And I'm gonna talk about it here, and I talk, I've been talking about it really within the last week. I hear a lot about the east side not getting what they need. And I'm, if you know, I'm from Berg. I lived also on the east side for a little while on, on Evelyn. And I believe we have an opportunity with the Air Base Park to have that be that Bayou Country sports plec of the east side, right? There's a plan that's been put out there. There's a splash park, that's all that's been done. It's no different to me than when Bayou Country sports plec was under Rec 2-3 and there was only so much they could do as a rec district. That's under the parish now. It's at the same level as the Civic Center. And so we want to take that same opportunity and the things that we're doing on the west side, and we want to bring that to the residents on the east side. I feel like you deserve it. I feel like it's over time that it needs to get done. And it's nothing against the rec district and what they're doing, but to me, this also becomes an economic development engine and an opportunity to do some cool things that maybe you can't even do on the west side with the uh, air base, uh, the softball complex and all that. There's some fields right there. There's a lot of opportunities to do some things to where residents don't have to travel all the way to the west side of the north side of the parish to get to the facilities that should be in your own backyard. And so that's something else that we're working on. And to go back to, you know, when I call about that master plan, there are still some rec districts that don't have pools. There are still some rec districts that might not have a good gym, right? And so part of this whole conversation with master plan is, you know, how close do we have things to an area and what does it take for some residents that I know probably have one car, might be a single mom, you know, we got to make sure we have accessibility to the quality of life. Again, no matter where you live, no matter how old you are, right? Pickleball, some, you know, I love some of the things and some of the lunches that I go to uh, related to the seniors. I called Bingo the other day, you know, and making sure all of our residents know there's some cool stuff going on in the parish every day. Making sure you have access to the information to know that you go play Bingo and win $200 on a blackout. I had a great time calling that, by the way. Any questions on quality of life branding? No? Man, okay. Destination. So, again, a little bit more about the Bike Country Sports Park. We have a soccer field lighting project. We have the boys' uh, common area and concessions. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about why don't we have tournaments, right? When the parks were built, they were built of a certain size that didn't really promote at that time the ability to have some of these tournaments of what we call the high school level and that, that age group. So the fields are being expanded. Uh, we're looking at turfing some of those fields also. The missing piece with all that being done was a concession stand at the front to run that all out of. It's gonna make us competitive at that tournament level by these changes that are being made. And then we're also in the process of working on engineering for tennis courts. The only tennis courts we have are where the Renaissance was on St. Charles. And we're actually in the process of doing some things with that lease till this is finished to make those, that facility better because that's pretty much the only place that people, you can do tennis in the parish. And then American Legion, you know, uh, first responders, veterans, everybody that serves, that's very near and dear to my heart. My uh, grandpa was a World War II veteran, my papa was a World War I veteran, I got a lot of uncles that served. I was this close to serving, I am gonna play football, and I still feel like I missed something, but to have a facility that all of our veterans organizations can come together and work out of, and also that, that facility be used to rent, to generate income and revenue, is what's gonna happen in the American Legion of Williams. It was started, the roof is completed, HVAC is completed. We're expecting the design for the final phase to make it to where it's a usable facility for the design to be done on October 24, and then we gotta go to bed and get the work done. But we're gonna have a facility in Terrebonne Parish where all veterans services and all veterans can go to, to basically get any need they, need, they have, right? And from there, um, we're just gonna, again, address a gap, something that maybe at some point, maybe we create something where veterans do work 
and, and go around and help other veterans. I mean, there's so many opportunities we can have. There's actually a court right there that as we were looking at this building, I see a tennis court that belongs to the parish. And I'm like, what are we doing with this? And I was like, man, that'd be great to put pickleball. And then we could have the American Legion sell, like, you know, snacks and that kind of stuff and maybe run some pickleball tournaments or four square, whatever we want to play. Again, going back to that quality of life and bringing things together of different age groups. So any questions on that? Yes, sir. First of all, I thank you all for your service and everybody that is a first responder, a veteran. And uh, yeah, go to Montague, get some coffee. Right. Yes, sir. It's the one on Williams. I don't know the post number off the top of my head, uh, but it's right there on Williams Avenue. Le Legion Williams. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Um, bayous. I can't remember the last time I saw a Bayou Dredge or Clean, except for the work we did since I've been in office a little bit. But, um, you know, we went through and did a cleaning and clearing and snagging. We started at Lafayette and worked our way up to Westside Boulevard. Kind of used the funds that we had at the time, but we have another project we'll be kicking off. Again, it's a, to me, it's about healthier waterways. It's about access to waterways. It's fresh water for, you know, drinking and activities and well, Louisiana's by a country, we barely have access to our waterways. And so the next project is to make sure we do everything we can to get the bayou healthy from that point to the parish line going north, right? Uh, you go through some of the air, I mean, it's trees, it's everything else. We're going to get that cleaned up. We're going to get water flowing. We have a couple initiatives that we're working on to get more water into Bayou Terrebonne uh, through Bayou St. Louis, through Lafouche, uh, Bayou Lafouche. Uh, through a few different opportunities to get more water into Bayou Terrebonne and have that bayou be healthier. That's the one we're starting on. We're looking for more, more funding to do every other bayou to make sure they're constantly dredged, that they're healthy, that they're vibrant. You know, water, besides our people, water is, I feel like, our next best re natural resource. And so we want to make sure we're doing some things. Uh, we're getting some funding from the state to get that project done in Bayou Terrebonne, but that's where we're starting, not where we're finishing. Yes, sir. So that's a good question. What we can do is we can get with Candace and have that conversation after, you know, after after right here. Because I can tell you, just from being a business owner, if I hire somebody that don't have workers to come, I got to cover it, right? So that's something we could definitely have a conversation about with Miss Candace, who's over purchasing, and make sure we get those questions addressed. And and that hadn't gone to bid yet, so we're in the process of, of going to bid with that. Yes. All right. Uh, so derelict vessels. We have over 900 derelict vessels in our waterways. And right now we have a million dollars in insurance that we're working with to get that rolling. It's not going to be enough money. Again, it goes back to that healthy waterway. We're having conversations with the Corps, with Water Life Fisheries, with um, uh, Coast Guard. You know, how can we work better together to help make sure anything moving forward? Uh, we actually recently just learned that we think the Corps can tell us what was derelict since Ida, which maybe provides some opportunity for funding. We're waiting on uh, to get that information. But, uh, you know, with the million dollars we have in insurance, we said, what is the best impact, best bang for the buck? We're going to try to grab as many vessels as in one area with, you know, less MOB and DMOB and get as many vessels as we clean up with that million dollars. And if we have extra, we'll go on to the next area. But again, working, we're having these conversations with people at our state level. We're having conversations with people at the federal level. We're applying for grants. You know, that's one of the things we did is we actually, we had a grant rider in one area. We moved that grant rider in, in finance so that we can make sure we're doing everything we can to give that person the tools they need to be successful. 
uh, and those are opportunities for us to go after grants to get some of this stuff done also. Uh, any question on the bayous? Yes, sir. All of them, yes, sir. All that trash that y'all gather up, no telling. I mean, I don't know what it costs the taxpayer, but you, against that lot that stayed closed, you have to clean all that up. That's trash. And you have to keep going back to clean it up instead of having the lot open so it can drain. So we've had a lot of conversations about that lot. And, and me passing, I was like, this, I was like, why is this closed, right? So. Does everybody understand, and I'm going to ask this question and kind of go into this conversation. So there's the difference between gravity drainage and force drainage. By doing the pump stuff we did down the bayou, without putting something to stop the water, you basically just start pumping the intercoastal, right? So for them to pump that, this, this force drainage system down, we had to put something on this end that stops us from pumping down the intercoastal, which you'll never pump down, right? And so we're having conversations with the levy district of saying, can we open, you know, when's the last time we tried to open it? And it's not completely closed because there's water that does seep underneath it. But what, what is the opportunity for us to open it up more? And as soon as we did that one exercise, Alberto came rolling through and we had to end up closing it again. But we are having those conversations. It goes back to the thing we talked about earlier is when we do and don't close locks. But I know we can't keep the water out of the, in the measure I've heard, and I see him, I just saw him here earlier, you know, water out of Chauvin Brothers parking lot. We can't keep the water out of that parking lot without keeping the lock closed. And I say we. That's the levy district, but I consider it we. We're all responsible. We're all involved in this. And, and so that's what we're doing. We're having conversations about saying, well, you know, what if we pump down to here instead of there, which is all permitted, by the way. The federal government, the Corps, comes in and says, you're going to pump to this level. And that's what you're permitted to pump to. And what does that mean when we don't or do not pump to that level? And what does it mean when this is open or that is closed? And so I can tell you, and I, I'm going to point to Noah because he's been real big in bayous, and, you know, he, he's really taken that bull and ran with it, taking that bull by the horns and just really riding that bull, right? And, and that's a conversation he's having on a regular basis. Somebody's going to have to explain that to him. We can. Yeah, we will. Yeah. I, and, look, again, I had the same questions. And so that's all stuff that we can, we can get some maps and we can say this is what that means. And, and, you know, make sure we're including everybody that's part of that conversation to say, you know, Anybody, everybody got questions? And, and I got to give it to Ms. Kim. She helped us have this conversation to begin with. And she's had the same questions you did. So, All right, any other questions on bayous before we move on? I hope you guys are finding this informative. Yes, ma'am. Are there any plans to clean out Bayou Chauvin? Bayou Chauvin is bridge up to Bayou? So, again, like I talked about earlier, Bayou Terrebonne is that one. That's the one we got some money for. Uh, we're looking at what's the best bang for the buck on the derelict vessels. Um, and it's, again, we've had conversations. So the federal government's doing some earmarks more now than they did before. That's the conversation we have. I want healthier bayous. There's an NOAA, NOAA grant, it's $7 million across the country. The most somebody can get is a million dollars, but we apply for that grant. So maybe we get that million dollars and the next million dollars. And look, we, historically, nationwide, we do a great job of building stuff but not necessarily having the funding to maintain. We've been really concentrating to make sure what does it take to maintain the things we have? And, you know, learning things like an oil change on one of our pump stations is $6,000, right, for one pump. So how often are we running that pump, right? And, and having those kind of conversations to say, the more we run it, the more we got to change the oil. And, and what's that look like over a year, over five years? And really getting down and getting the data and putting some sensors in place to understand what salinity looks like, to understand what flow looks like, which way it's going, how fast it's flowing, and opportunities that maybe we don't use a pump here and there. And having those conversations with the people that have been doing this for 20 years and the experts that have been working in these areas, including the Levy District for all this time, again, working together to move and manage water, because that's our life now. Like it's, water's higher now than it was when I was younger, right? And, and why that happened, how it happened, we are where we are. We're in the business of moving and managing water, and we want to make sure we do everything we can to keep water out of residents' homes. Because I remember a time when Prospect and Tunnel used to flood, right? Prospect in the curve, Tunnel by the Popeyes. I can't remember the last time those two areas flooded. I'm not saying it won't ever happen again, but they don't flood now. And so we're making progress, and sometimes a storm like Ida comes along and changes all that. We just got to keep working hard and working together to make sure those issues are resolved. And again, I say buy your 10 ones first. 
The money for that project we got in 2012, is that right? Yeah. We're spending that money, right? Money we got, we're spending it. What's next? What can we do to help do some things to get our, all our waterways healthy and vibrant? All right, any other questions on bayous before we move on? Yes, sir. Well, we're talking about cleaning the bayous and like for drainage purpose and all, but we live in Coca Green, for instance, from Saving Canal South, Bayou Terrebonne, there's some of the other local bayous. I know Kim's probably aware of some of this. Uh, from Saving Canal to the end of uh, by Little Caillou, well, not the end of it, but where it, it stops by the channel. Uh, the channel is very narrow, it's very shallow. Big barges and boats go through there all the time, and what happens is the same fluff gets shifted all over the place. We can have this, all, everybody can get together and spend thousands of dollars and clean out boat slips so that you can get your boats in and out, and all it takes is one barge big barge 40 foot wide at eight foot and then it seems they don't know what what tidal flow is so they never show up at high tide but they constantly pushing the, fl the fluff back on the side it's a problem all the time we watch boats and barges get stuck and buy your little caillou all the time from our house we live we we one of uh, uh, two of i think eight or nine residents actually live out of the out of the floodgate system and uh, I'm just curious because there's been talk about that for years. I think Kim's mentioned it already about trying to help with that, using the, the mud and, and like putting it on, on the east side to, put, to help out to break some of the water flow when it comes from tropical storms and whatnot. But I'm just curious, is there anything in place to try to help that, that flow for navigation? Speaking of us talking to the Coast Guard is useless. You know, we constantly hear that they control a lot of this. But uh, I have a small farm on Bayou Grand Caillou, and it's the same thing. The bayou is very shallow, and y'all you, you have to know that from Cedar Grove Road north, uh, uh, you can't hardly float a P-Rog in there, so I have no idea where they expect the water to go when they drain it. Mm -hmm. That's some of the issues I'm thinking about. Now, the Coast Guard claims that that's navigable. They, they actually claim that that bayou is navigable right there, which is not. Right. Uh, so I'm just curious if y'all have any, any plans for that to try to help us out and then and, and to help us out down there. And I mean, Terrebonne Parish is a great recreational fishing industry, and that really inhibits it a lot down there. I, I won't even talk about the fact that on Ruin Street, they made my sister's new house had to go 10 foot above the ground on pilings. If I had won some of the highest property in Terrebonne Parish, that is obscene to me, but we won't get into that right well, now. I appreciate you not getting to that one, you know. <laughs> Somebody write that one down. So. I, look, we've had conversations, and I, I get my point of note here, because some of the things that we learned since I've taken office is Bayou Grand Cry is a great example. That pump pumps the bite, the pump that's further up above Ashland and everything, that pump pumps sediment, right? So it's what do we got to do to make sure that pump's not pumping sediment? Because when it pumps that sediment into that bayou, it makes it shallow. And also, what do we do is what does it look like to flow down? Bayou also, right? So we've, we've been looking at some maps and trying to figure out, you know, can we dredge here, dredge there? That's on our radar. Cedar Grove's on our radar. The Cooker Tree part I haven't heard about yet. Maybe Noah has. If not, we're going to get that information because we have a new Coast Guard person that just took over that we've already met with, and it's how can we work together? How can we – who's responsible for what, right? So we're learning, well, this person has authority to do this but doesn't have the authority to do that. So it's like, okay, well, I'm going to take this person and do this and this group and do that. And then this is what we're responsible for. And then we're gonna work with the levy district on this. And we're all gonna get in a room, we're gonna figure out an issue. Just like I'm doing here today, right? We're gonna get in a room, we're gonna have a conversation, we're gonna fix some issues, right? I feel like I have to say this, I was gonna start with it, and I didn't know if I should, but y'all all know we don't have the money to do everything we need to do, right? Is everybody is anybody surprised to hear that? So what happens, for example, I got a call about a lift station, a guy couldn't flush his toilet on Levron Street after a heavy rain. And he's disabled and he was mad. And I was like, I don't blame you because if I was in your shoes, I'd be mad too. So I have a conversation with Public Works and I say, number one, is this a project, right? Do, you, do we know this needs to be fixed? Yes. How long has it been, have we been knowing about it? You know, it varies depending on where it is. How, how do we fund that? Do we have a funding source? Have we gathered a collection of all these type of projects? And if we add those together, what is that number? And I'll use road striping as a great example. Got in, hey, we need to stripe some roads. How much money do we have? Oh, we got about $250,000, right? Okay, we looked at it. We have a list of priorities of road striping, right? And we're talking, we're going to talk parish roads. We're working on fixing everything, but we'll talk parish roads real quick. 
Hollywood, St. Charles, we're going to try to get those striped. But I also took and said, if we striped everything, how much does that cost? $3.2 million, right? So I said, you know what? They got this infrastructure bill I keep hearing about. It seems like road striping would be a great project for an infrastructure bill. And we sent that to the federal government, our, our Congress people, and said, help me find money for this, right? So I get road striping fixed and then work on the next thing. And, and we've had a conversation with DOTD. I talked about we meet with them quarterly. I've had a conversation with the governor. We gathered how much would it cost for us to cut all state areas, cut all that grass. It's about $1.6 million. Now, I could take $1.6 million in our parish budget that we don't have the money to do all our projects for, and I could put that towards that, but it's gonna, it's gonna, I gotta rob Peter to pay Paul. But I had a conversation with DOTD and the governor and about like, can we do some more? And so we have, and Clay, how many, how many uh, areas we're cutting for the state right now? Right now, currently, how many areas uh, with that CEA? Between, uh, and, uh, right, so we have those two. We're looking at adding three or four more areas are probably some of the most populated uh, uh, traveled areas. We're gonna cut a little bit more. All right, we're going to cut a little bit more. And then I pushed like I did. to. I wanted the same CEA for roads. I wanted the same CEA for ditches. That if they can't get to it, we can. But last time I got stopped from doing it, right? So I'm not afraid to go, hey, look, this is, this is crazy. Clendenning at 24 that they're working on right now. A year and a half ago, my father-in-law's axe on his boat trailer broke. And so I went to one of these meetings. And I said, what's this look like, right? And they kind of looked at me with the eyes open. For those that may or not know, may or may not know, DOTD, we're a sub-district of New Orleans, right? So we get kind of what's left over. And it, it is what it is, and the governor's talking about restructuring it. They're doing a study right now. But when I ask a question about that project, and they all kind of look at I me, mean, you know, six months and all, and then I raise my hand again, and I go, what's considered an emergency? Because in the parish, we have a contract that if we have an emergency, we go get it. The state isn't that flexible, doesn't have that opportunity. It takes them a little bit longer to do stuff. Um, but again, if it comes down to it, we try to get them to grind. We find there was issues with a grinder. You know, we had a, a DOTD guy tell us to one of his guys going, if I get you a grinder, can we take care of all the bumps on all these state highways? And he's like, yes. And as I understand it, hopefully that comes soon where we could at least take care of all the bumps down 56, 57, 55, you know, all these things that cause our residents to have safety issues while driving, you know. Uh, if I got to get out there in a the grinder myself, I'm going to get out there in a the grinder myself, and Kim's going to stripe it. <laughs> so I'm just saying. But, but and look, Kim's been in these meetings, and, and Carly's been in these meetings. You know, we all are just trying to work together to resolve these issues. And, and trust me, if I could do it all, I would right now. And we're trying to be smart about it. What I've spent the first six months by setting up our people for success and making everything measurable is a concept to do more with what we have, right? I feel like we already have an increased, and I'm going to say this, and hopefully nobody disagrees with me, but I feel like morale's up, and I feel like people are really enjoying what they're doing. There's an efficiency that comes with that. That's one of the things I did for a living, is I turned company, I made companies more profitable, more efficient, more productive by putting a policy here, a decision tree there, adding a little tech here. I've helped turn profit around for companies in six months, working to do those same concepts, and I got to commend the directors and the employees that have taken this on and are helping me get it done. I'm only as good as my team, and I'm doing everything I can to make sure the team is successful and they have everything they need. And when they don't, they know. Come tell me what we don't have. If you have an issue, send me, a, send me an address. Send me a picture. We're going to get it to the person that's dealing with that, and we're going to make sure they have everything they need. And we're going to ask them, how do you think we should fix this? And they might go, nine times out of ten, this is what I should do. And at tenth time, we're going to get a couple people together, and we're going to get the right people in the room. We're going to make that decision. So I did get a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's a very important topic. Yes, sir. Yes, Jason, so when it goes back to that slide on accountability, I mean, it really makes me raw that we got to do the job of the state. You know, and, and are we getting any kind of compensation or any? any so for the CEAs that we have, we are getting compensation. And the CEAs we're going to continue to add, we are getting compensation, right? But sometimes... We're going to go clean the tunnel because it needs, it needs a cleaning. And sometimes I can't get compensation for it. That doesn't mean we're not going to do it. And, uh, you know, it, uh, when the governor says I'm going to do a study to figure out, when he was running, he told me in, in front of a bunch of people, I'm going to blow up DOTD, right? He's going to restructure DOTD. And 
you know, the bureaucracy side of government is where government has the issues. It's not government as a whole. We have a lot of very hardworking, passionate people that wants to get things done. But I was told about a project that we had money for that to go through the process of acquiring land and doing the research and doing everything we got to do legally so we don't lose something later on, this project we had funding for when I took office is going to start construction at the beginning of 26. Unfortunately, it's a pump station project that's going to be underneath ground and it's going to affect a lot of people. Unfortunately, there's no other way to do that. The BK Bridge, you can ask Candace and a couple of these people, I've asked a thousand questions, a thousand different ways going, is there any way we can build this bridge? And that's why I got a graphic and I went on HTV and I said, based on the only thing that's not going to be new is the frame. Everything else is getting changed. They got water in the, uh, in the uh, bridge house, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the bridge house, but anyway, um, the, electric, the electric, electrical controls were ruined, right? So we're changing that, we're changing some bearings, we're changing some gears, we're changing some cables, we're changing the span. To build a temporary bridge takes just as long to build a regular bridge, right? But that's a different conversation of the fight that Kim's been fighting with Robinson and Boudreaux Canal, where they're gonna build, they looked at building a temporary bridge for Robinson, it didn't happen. They're gonna build Boudreaux on the side of the current bridge. We're trying to do everything we can to make sure people get around, emergency services get what they need to get every time, all the time. Do, do any of these contracts have some kind of opportunity where these guys get it done early? Mm -hmm. get paid they do, and they have penalties. And so, they do. Uh, some of them probably do. I don't know if all of them do. I think that goes back to that little bit of that restructuring. Especially as important as that bridge is. Mm -hmm. and, and look, I, I don't know. Has it, everybody, who hasn't dealt with a contractor in here? And I'm not going to say anything bad about contractors. But things take a little while, right? You get, we, we've got so much rain recently. You're going to have some of those delays. I'm not making excuses for anybody. What I've had a conversation with DOTD about is I just want the information. If it's November and then that changes to January, I just want to know it's November and now it's January. Because we posted something about the Berg Bridge in August, and then that became November, and now that's January. And I said, just for us to know, I think eliminates some frustration, not all of it, right? I mean, it's, it's taking way too long. It makes zero sense. But that's also why the governor's doing a study to restructure DOTD. The, per, the Berg Bridge is a perfect example, right? When I talked about St. Uh, Charles and Tunnel Boulevard and the work that got done there, he told me, let's give him a week, and let's see what the result is. And I sent him a picture of the asphalt and said, I'd have done concrete, right? I mean, it's, it's that conversation to give him and the people that we deal with at the state level the information they need so that they can be successful, right? Here's the information, more information so you can make decisions and maybe we need to pass this bill or change this rule. I don't know what that was. All right. Uh, you answer your question? Yeah. Hey, look, I can tell you, I understand. And, and, um, that's why I ran. I ran. I want to try some things differently, you know. And when I learned if I do an emergency order, I don't have to get a permit. I was like, man, just line those things up right here. I'm gonna go down the line signing them. But again, we gotta we gotta work on getting that funding, and that's why I try to do be smart about it, right, and be efficient about it. All right. Uh, moving on. So we did launch. I don't know if you saw it or not, and I, I give no other credit for really pushing this. Also, the Bio Revival campaign. And, you know, that is mitigation, mitigating trash during Mardi Gras. So I don't know if you saw at the mall, there was an orange fence running along the bayou. We put some berms at bridges going down the bayou that if something made it into the water, it didn't make it into the intercoastal. And then our solid waste department and our uh, public works department did a great job of trying to minimize the amount of trash. We put nets on the end of some culverts. We put some felt on top of drains to do everything we could to minimize the amount of trash that gets in the bayou. We have litter signage. You're going to drive around the parish on bridges. You're going to see litter signage. Please don't litter our bayous. Again, back to the cleanup of the five major bayous, beginning with Bayou Terrebonne. You're going to hear us say it over and over and over again. And getting them healthy so that we can maintain them. And we got stuff that's been this way for 20 years. You know, again, a waterway, one of our best natural resources. I know cities that have built them to have them. We have them. We want to use it. So. DOTD covered a couple things on this already, uh, but uh, as of yesterday, I think it was, uh, 24 East Main at Clendenning, contractor day 15 of 30, that's in process of being redone. 
Uh, LA-24 from RV, RV Court to West Street. Bid awarded, notice to proceed coming. The Bird Bridge, I talked about that January 2025. I was like, what percentage do you think that's gonna be? Can you say like 90% January 2025? They said 90% January 2025. Uh, Robinson Canal Bridge, there was a concrete mixture issue. They had to redo some stuff. They had to test it. Uh, and we're working on, uh, is, is that on schedule? Has that been delayed? Having those conversations. Uh, grass cutting, we talked about. Lily maintenance, if I could, if I could handle lilies and lead bugs, I think I'd run for governor. So working on lilies first. Lead bugs, uh, we'll see what we can do. I think mosquito hawks kill mosquitoes, kill lead bugs, I don't know, something like that. And we talked about ro uh, road striping. So any questions on, on that part? And that's my presentation. I realize I was this far already. I would love your feedback. So you can scan this QR code or go over here to this table if you don't even know what a QR code is, because we do things both technology and not technology related to understand what you thought of what we presented here today. Again, I'm gonna answer questions. I'm not done. I'm just done with this presentation, but I'm here to answer any and every question until everybody has every question asked and hopefully answered till you guys are ready to leave. And I thank you again for making time to be here. And uh, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned earlier in here about parish-wide weather stations. Mm -hmm. Do we have access to that? If I'm not mistaken, and Earl can probably answer that question, question? parish-wide weather stations, do they have access to that data? We don't have a, a parish-wide weather system. We're working on it, though. So like, we're working on that, and when we do, it will be public space. What about the one on top of the show van water Oh, that's the that's a climate vision radar. That's a private company that owns that radar, and um, so and the weather was service uses it, but it's not on a public station. But yeah, when we work on these parish wide, uh, which is part of the city GDR money, once that's out, it will be available to all of our residents. But you're welcome at any time you need to do anything to call Earl at EOC. He, he's 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 the weather whisperer. He tells us this is going to rain. It isn't going to rain. Like when we have an event coming up. It's fixing our, we look at Earl and be like, Earl, can we have this event outside? He's like, yeah, and then you can whatever. So, all right, thank you. Anything else? Come on, we got to have more questions than that. Yes, sir. Whatever happened to the trustees that you used to see working on the highways? All right, so I'll tell you what I know, and then we can always get more information. So, after Ida, of course, we shipped a lot of uh, people out of because of the jail and not being able to keep people there. Coming back after Ida, we, we had limited place to keep trustees. I know they've been building that back up as it goes. They're also doing what's called a work release program. And so I can tell you right now, like we've had the trustees pressure wash some parking lots and some other things. And so we are working together with the sheriff to get that done. Uh, I know they work with our public works. They work with our solid waste group. I know I've seen them pick up trash. And so uh, if there's a situation where you see something, maybe we could use them in a situation. Let us know, but I think Tim and I have a great working relationship, and uh, usually when I call and ask something, he handles it. So I can tell you it's there. It's been coming back ever since, and it's going to continue to come back and provide opportunities to get some stuff done. Yes? Anybody else? Come on. we got to have more questions than that. Come on. You tell me I, didn't an I answered everything? Oh, not you. Not you, sir. No, next. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I guarantee you, Kim's probably got a better update than I do.
go to auction, try and get the money back for that. So that's that's the whole thing. I'm all over it. I, I promise. Like I am talking to Bella, um, emailing back and forth. I hate that that's still up. It's ugly. It's so, disgusting. Yeah. And I want it gone. So, but that's and, and I'll tell you, you know, outside of the money we talked about, American Rescue Dollars. Our average budget every year for condemnation demolition is about $150,000, right? So we're having conversations. What grant can we find? What, can we, what money can we use to help get some of this stuff condemned, torn down? You know, the first thing we like to make sure, is it on the list and where is it at in that process? And at some point, you know, maybe it comes up for a sheriff's cell and somebody else could get a hold of it. We got to definitely go through that process. And, and look, part of the things that maybe people don't know you know, a property gets goes to sheriff sale, and I know they were in the process of changing laws. I can't remember if it changed or not, but historically, when a property was a person purchased a property at sheriff sale, if the person came back two and a half years later and paid everything that was up to that time period, they get it back. So if you put anything into it, everything else, I understand the state was working on making that time period shorter, but think about the fact that I got to hold this property for three years. Because if the person that owns it comes back, they, they get it all. And everything I put into it, I lose. Some of that is, again, making our state reps and senators aware of that situation and working to change those laws at the state level, which I understand they are working on, if not finished already. Good. All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The board. We are having those conversations. Because right now Montague is got the front door closed and the back door is open. Yes. So, so we're walk down through the back door. We are having those conversations because there's also another project to put locks on the intercoastal. So it's you could possibly build these things to be obsolete later on when those locks get put in place. Yeah. And we're working on gathering all that data to make sure you know, there's a conversation about a lock at by Terrebonne right below the intercoastal, a lock at the company canal, all those things. Again, as we have those conversations about moving water and getting that funding and working through CPRA and other organizations to make sure when we, when we put money into a project that we're not wasting that money. Yes, sir. So, yeah, the preference would be to leave that open a lot more than it is closed for Terrence. I guarantee you we are, we are having those conversations. But I know there's a lot of things to manage in between. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, sir. I, I wanted to, uh, you know, maybe say a few words about mental health uh, and the drug problem we have down on the bayou. Uh, uh, I, I know you mentioned before that you're working with a few organizations. Anything specific to help out, I mean, that you can share with? So I talked about working with Bayou Community Foundation, uh, Star Corporation. Uh, it just so happens I've been helping get some apps built for resources for both Star Corporation and the food bank so that you can understand what's there. And, and part of that conversation with Bayou Community Foundation, so they had a behavioral summit. They had about 200 people in the room. And in that room, there were people that didn't know other people existed and what they did. So we got all the resources in the region together that says, okay, Let's look at everything. And I have a conversation about a decision tree, depending on your age, depending on your issue, going through a decision tree to understand where the gaps are. And that's something we're having an active conversation about right now of where are our gaps. And then once you identify that, you can actually use that same decision tree to do an assessment to figure out what services and everything that you need. And so we have a few different organizations. Uh, some of them deal with drugs. Some of them kind of do some things with some employment. Does that rain? I'll tell you, that guy's more right than a weatherman right there. But again, I go back to that regional conversation because we got we got to understand. And I, look, I'm Terrebonne Parish president. I want to help Terrebonne Parish residents. So if we got people that aren't from here that we're helping, maybe we get them back where they were. At the end of the day, I want to get them the services. But again, my number one concern is that Terrebonne Parish resident. And when we talk about mental health and we talk about drugs, you know, fentanyl is the leading cause of death for those under 55 years old, right? And we, need, we get in conversations about the border and all kind of other stuff that happens, but it really just trying to make sure 
Why is somebody having a mental health issue? Why is somebody having a drug issue? You know, are they in the system? Have we done some case management with them? Or do we have the resources to get them what they need and trying to fill those gaps? And I'm telling them, we have a conversation, I think like it's once a week with Bayou Community Foundation. And uh, Fletcher got, just got awarded a $200,000 grant. You know, we have, shortage, we have a shortage of psychiatric and, and counselors and everything else. You start having conversations about what can we do from a telemedicine perspective with some of that. But it is working to make sure we get the right resources to the right people. And we've been working heavily on that since I took office. So, so I can tell you, you call the parish and we'll get you to where you need to go. Star Corporation is another great resource. A lot of times we're going to send people there and, and they have, I mean, they have the unit over there behind the Civic Center that's getting ready to go through an expansion process. Um, and then you get to the conversation of, should we have a shelter? Should we, you know, is there a place for people that have mental health issues? I think there's two in the state, they're packed. You know, I, look, I think there's a whole conversation around how mental health is dealt with when it comes to insurance and Medicaid and you know, some things that Medicaid don't pay. And, and again, we get to more probably of a state and federal conversation. Then I come back to Terrible Parish and I say, I wanna help every resident that has the issue in Terrible Parish. And if you're not sure who to call, you call us. We're gonna help you get to the right place to get them the resources they need. maybe their dad, whatever it may be, um, is that they don't know where to go. And START may not be the place that they want to go to because they want a rehab. Right. And I don't know that START has that. So what I'm talking about with START and Bayou Community Foundation is, you know, th there have been resource books printed, you know, and as soon as the resource, resource book gets printed, it's out of date. And that's why, if you looked at, we had a summit, and I'm trying to remember the time frame of that summit, I want to say it was in March. In that summit, there were people in that room didn't realize we had some services that we have, right? And so I know Bayou Community Foundation and Star Corporation are working together for a resource guide that says, this is the resources that are available in the parish. If you don't, again, what's missing? How do we get people to those resources and gather it? And, I, and as we've talked, and I've shared your name with multiple people, you know, maybe that's a conversation we bring you back into and say, where do you see some gaps? Because that's what I feel like when I went through that summit, I said, we got to identify where the gaps are, not only from the perspective of what services are missing, but if somebody's trying to get services and they get to a point where they don't know where else to go, again, that's that assessment that says you need this kind of service. Well, that service might be in New Orleans. That service might be in Baton Rouge. That service might be in Terrebonne Parish. But just being able to track that, and like I said, a, a, the Star Corp app is coming online. You won't have to log in. You can pick a category. It tells you what the closest resources are in Terrebonne Parish. And then if you, if you don't see anything, reach out to them because they've kind of become a collection point for all the resources. Not that they provide the resources, but they can point you in the right direction. Yes, sir. When it comes to drug addictions and dealers on the street, I mean, after the fact, after you hooked on drugs, you go for help. But if you can stop the dealers, put teeth where the dealers are, make the, the fines more, more prevalent, you know, uh, get the dealers off the street. 
then and then we know in the neighborhood who's dealing and who's not dealing. But you make a phone call and then it's nothing done. Get the dealers off the street and they're gonna make it harder for the, the users to get what they need. And that's a that's a step in being in the sobriety of the person. Yes, sir. And I don't know if you're aware or not, but the go one of the first sessions the governor did was on exactly that. And, they, and they're working to make some changes, and I think it's going to take a little, little way to come down, but he is taking a tough stance on crime and drugs and everything that you're talking about. And so, you know, I can tell you specifically, so we have HPD, Travis here, that's city limits. I've seen them do some bust and, and working. I got a picture two days ago about some drugs that are now off the street. So, um, you know, if it's outside of the city limits, you know, we have the sheriff's office, they have a narcotics group. Uh, sometimes, you, and this is something I want to make sure everybody hears, it may not seem like some action's happening on something, but if you, like for example, in that situation, if you had an investigation going on, you can't really say anything because you don't want them to know you're investigating them, right? So right. there's some things that are happening and, and we're trying to make sure from a nuisance and bait perspective, using the things with GIS mapping that you could look at a map and see this house has a permit and this house, this house has a nuisance and abatement issue. And so as we develop our systems, that's something else, I'm a tech guy, we're up working on our accounting system, working on our mail system, our GIS system, our work order system. The goal would be to click on your phone on a map and report an issue, right? right. Before that, it might be a work order that you fill out on a website that goes somewhere and then you can see the status that way. But we're actively going through and upgrading four or five different systems right now to make it easier for our residents to self-service, report issues, and get updates to those issues. And as I'm going through things that are reported to me, I keep a list of all these addresses that I'm passing on, then I come back around and say, hey, where are we at on this? What's going on with that? Or what system can I use to figure out what the status of this is? Mm -hmm. And can I understand that myself, or is it not clear? And then what can we do to make it clear? So, anybody, any other questions? We got rain now, we might as well hang out a little while and talk, right? Okay, I got it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you're our parish president. Yes, ma'am. All the people in the low-lying areas are gradually moving out because our areas have nothing to offer the people. If you want to have a good time, you have to go to home. There's nothing going on in the low-lying areas. What do you have as a vision for us in the low-lying areas? Okay, so the question may not be heard us, but she's saying everybody's moving north. What things do we have to do for the low-lying areas? What plans do I have? And, and so to me, the first step I took with that was the whole quality of life department. The next part of that is, is the community outreach of going into these communities and understanding what issues they have and what can we do to bring them resources, right? And So you just make sure everybody, she says no activities. And so what, what I would love, so I'll tell you something that, um, that we have, we have some stuff in the works. So we're, we are talking about maybe some few places for the fish off of, uh, some paddle launches and kayak launches. There's a few things to get, I call ecotourism around the area. But the question I would also have is, what activities do you think we can do that we're not doing? And, and where can we do those activities, right? Is it in a rec district? Is it uh, by a school? You know, having us working with the school district and the rec districts and the sheriff's office and all these different groups, I'd love to know, like, what's one activity we don't have anymore that we could bring back? Because I know what some of, the, some of the rec districts are doing for children in some areas now, and I see Jim moving around here like he wants to answer a question. You want to chime in? You want to hear? Okay. Uh, but that, but look, Jim Wendell, Quality Life Director, you know, he was a council member of Lafouche. He's dealt with recreation for a while, and, and that's, he's tasked with where are we missing activities? Where do we need activities? You know, I, I helped put together an eSports camp that's in its second year where we bring devices, computer devices and gaming to kids that might not normally have fourth year, well, fourth year, but twice in Temple Parish, to bring devices to kids that maybe wouldn't have that opportunity, because that's how I got where I am. I'm a pool boy that grew up in a trillion in Berg. Technology helped me get where I am today. Technology tears down bridges, it bridges gaps. I mean, it just, it's the opportunity to give somebody an opportunity. And so we're trying to work to do things like that. 
and get resources and get activities in hands. But again, it's, you know, it's understanding what's, what group aren't we servicing? What, is there a pool close by? Is there activities like football and baseball and that kind of stuff close by? And if not, what's the best course of action to get that resolved? And I see, I see Kim shaking her head back there. I know that's something she's been working in our council district. And that's something, that's something we're working with all our council members to make sure, like, what, what are the things that you see that we can fix? And we're going to have some meetings about, and we did this when I, before I took office, after I took office. It's like, it's like, what are the main needs in your area? What can we do as a parish? Because my God, it deals with programming activities. I want him to know, hey, what's missing? Where's the gap? And then he's going to work between the rec districts and quality of life to make sure there are as many gaps as filled as we can. And that's what I look for is that, and we can talk after, it's like, if you know, hey, this street or this community, we need activities for, these ki for the kids, and let's figure out who we can work with to make that happen sooner rather than later. I agree. I understand. Go ahead. Well, I mean, it's fortunate and unfortunate, but at the American Legion, in Money Give, that's exactly what we're trying to do, to pull all the Bayou communities together. We're not just Money Give, we, we show them, we punish them. You know, we, we burg, we're up the Bayou. And we, we're trying to put together like a Friday night Fado Dove, you know, like we used to have, yeah. you know? And, and we want to be family orientated to where you can bring your kids and you can come and enjoy yourself and we're going to have refreshments. So it's things that we're working as, as veterans at the American Legion trying to get in the Bayou community. Yeah, and I know like Monty, you just had a children's fishing, or fishing rodeo, not children's fishing rodeo, and some rides and stuff. And so, um, you know, one of the things I've really worked to make sure we do is provide hope and opportunity, right? And so for you to be here, for you to say, hey, we need, let's do something for children and adults in this region. You know, before you leave, I want to have a conversation about Let's talk age groups. Let's talk about what we have. Again, let's go back to the gaps. Same thing we talked about with mental health. What are the gaps in quality of life in the areas that you're talking about? And getting information to the people to say, hey, maybe we need to do this tutoring program. Maybe we need to do dances, right? Maybe we need to have bingo. I mean, there's so many things that some of our rec districts are doing great. My question is, okay, if this rec district's doing it, what can we do to get this rec district right next to it to do the things? And, and that's what when you look at what we've been doing since I've been in office, we're not reinventing the wheel. A lot of stuff has already been done somewhere else. It's no different than when you have that conversation when the rec district that says, this one's doing these five things and this one's doing one. Well, how can we get these the other four at this one just like that one because it's already being done? And, and again, maybe we could partner. Maybe there's some opportunities for some efficiencies to address some of those issues just by sharing information and having conversations because this rec district may not know this rec district's getting some stuff done. So, somebody else had a question? Yes, sir. What I want to say is this. Uh, we all belong to Post 272, and we are doing something for the children. We did. We had Boo on the Bayou last year, which was a great success for us. We're doing that again this year. Now, we, w we would like for the communities to come to Post 272 so that we can at least get the input from the community of what they would really like. But she brought up this great idea. They have no entertainment out here. We're open for that. Our hall is large enough to hold enough people in the community to do these type of functions. We're right there with the rec district. We need to have that gym partnered with us so we can collaborate on different situations in that area. We have four different businesses there. We have the Children's Carnival Club, we have the Lions Club, we have the Post, and we also have the gym. But we're not collaborating together. They're all separate. So the idea that this young lady brought up is great for us. So we, we're open for that opportunity so that you can come in to us and work with us to build that community back up so that we don't be looking for somewhere else to go all the way to Homer, all the way to another town. We can do it right here on the bike. I agree, and I, again, appreciate the stuff you guys are doing. Any other questions? Anything? Man, look. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry. What you got? Uh, well, I remember here on the slide you had that the, uh, the men's softball complex was going to get brought up. 
brought back. But I mean, that's another thing. You got a lot of kids that's playing ball that's coming out of high school, going to college. Who's gonna? How that's gonna get them back here? Well, when they come out of college and all that, and they can go hang out and play ball with their buddies. I just played in a softball tournament in Baton Rouge that had over 70 teams in it two weeks ago, and it was a charity deal. I mean, that brings in a lot of people. I remember growing up, they always had the softball tournaments at the complex. They had tournaments in Montague. They had tournaments down there in Chauvin. They don't have that. I've been, since the hurricane, I've been traveling to Prairie to play ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, you know, We've had some great work at Bunker Sportsplex. There's a lot of stuff to, that needs to get done still. And again, it's that conversation when we talk quality of life, mm -hmm. of, of, of figuring out where the gaps are, trying to bring, bring these groups together. When I talk about that board is that, you know, first conversation should be, what is everybody doing? And then you, in that group you go, and you're going to have one group that says, well, I'm not doing any of that. Like, well, here's some papers. Here's how we do it. Here's how we arrange it, organize it, and then how, and I gotta give Jim some credit, I feel like he has been out working those relationships, right? Again, we've had a, a turbulent history in the past, but Jim's going out to these reg districts and saying, what do you need? How can I help you? And, and look, it started with my daughter graduated college. My son's getting ready, he's a senior in high school. She, she was talking about not coming back. And we're actually in an opportunity for her to maybe be back here soon. And then again, if they leave the opportunity to come back, and I've had many conversations with young adults, and they say, we need more stuff to do. And I kind of ask that same question, like what? And they think and all, and I said, well, did you know about this event or this building or this activity? And, and they're like, no. And so, you know, I, I part, it was part of the Hatch Grant. We had the Boucherie, we had the Momo Walk. We did every kind of advertising you can imagine, but still heard the, I didn't know you guys had this going on. And so, you know, we're trying to spread it out through Facebook and through other so other channels, right? Billboards and HTV and everywhere else. And no matter what you do, you still miss that message. By us coming into these communities, and, and if you listen to a council meeting, every at the end of every council meeting, I go through, these are the things that are going on between here and the next council meeting. And we might miss some stuff, but hey, if you know of something going on, let us know. We want to let the, the people know about it. And, and also at the same time, Hey, can you help us? Like, you got some ideas? I mean, I because got plenty of ideas. I didn't say it yet, but look, we're, are we a community that relies on government? We're not, right? That's, that's what we pride ourselves on. And so when I talk about the conversation about government not being a hindrance, it's going to take all of us. I can't do it by myself. The directors all can't do it. I tell people, at some point, I'm going to have a conversation with probably everybody in this room that says, hey, I need some help. Or you come in with an idea and it's like, you have a great idea. Let me connect you with so-and-so and let's see what we could do to build upon that. We definitely are all responsible for bringing this place back. And, and my slogan was moving terrible and forward, right? To lose 15,000 people in 10 years. That's where we're at right now, right? And, and for whatever reason, we got to where we are in every situation that we are. My, my conversation is about what we got to do to take us from here to where I know we can be, where we can deserve that we will accomplish. And, I, and again, I say, hey, you got some ideas? You want to get something done? Let's get together and have those conversations. You can grab Mr. Jim Window right here. He's a quality life guy. I'm sure he's dying to know what, what things you think we can maybe do that maybe we hadn't thought of. We don't have, we might have all the answers, right? We want to hear. Which one, if you don't mind me asking? Right. But hey, and we're having uh, it, we, we're having these conversations right now, right? Every weekend they had tournaments there during the summertime. Yep, and and that's what we want to do. Again, we want to. That's one big deal that y'all don't have coming in. There's three questions I feel like you can ask for any issue you deal with personally and professionally. What have you done? What are you doing? And what's holding you up? So in that particular situation, whoever's in charge of that, that's that's what I want to ask them. What's holding you up? And then. How are we going to fix that? How can we resolve that? What part can the parish government be involved in, to, again, to help move that forward? And so, thank you for that. Jason, I will let you know that a lot of what is happening in Chauvin is like the fire chief. She's kind of taking the bull by the horns, and she does trunk or treat, and she gets all the businesses that are all the businesses that are located here, and some maybe even in Montague that come in and 
donate their time and give to the kids for trunk or treat. Then there's the April, uh, well, not April, but there's the Easter thing that we did. That's all the businesses throwing down all of these things. Our parks are not where they need to be in Chauvin. We are lacking parks. We're lacking um, things for kids to do at the parks. We're lacking, uh, you know, just to be able to park at the Smith Ridge Park, it, it's atrocious. I mean, you're going to lose your car going up in there. And I think it comes down to what it costs to put things together because everything is kind of going towards, I, I'm not going to say everything. You have FEMA money that's fixing the, the Smith Ridge gym, but a lot of the monies are going towards the Klondike Park, whereas the park that's down where the pool was, and you still have kids here. You just do not have what it takes to have the activities um, down here. Our, we have no baseball fields that we could possibly use at this point. That's unconscionable here. We should have ballparks here for the kids. And so now we have to figure out how to get it. And a lot of it comes down to money and what it costs to put it together because Ida came in and tore up the field that was right there by Smith Ridge. So I think that those things need to be looked at and the businesses, that's why it's so important for us to shop local, eat local, you know, uh, support the fishing industry because all that pours back in to your community. That's how important it is. And there are some changes that we're looking at as a council to, to put together so that people have more things to do. You know, I go by the council, I mean, I go by the senior citizens uh, place and I, I go try and figure out what's going on, what we can do. So, and I think some of it is, is the council getting involved in their areas, which they do, and go ask what is needed. Listen, that's the first question out of my mouth when I walk in. I, I might tell them what's coming around the corner, but it's like, what else, what do we have here, you know? So I think that some of that in the parks is that we have to realize that some of it got damaged for, for Ida, and it's taken money, and FEMA is slow to pay out. Yes, and, and you know, we got a risk management group involved. We're going around to facilities. Uh, we have some facilities that have had risk for years and holding those rec districts accountable that says this has got to be fixed, torn down, removed, uh, trying to help move forward with some of the FEMA-related money because if something was damage-related to FEMA, it should be repaired at, with, with, you know, it says hurricane, but with FEMA, right? So, uh, and then there's other opportunities that says, you know, maybe we go after a grant and maybe we do some things. Uh, one of the things that we're working on quality of life is, is a, a nonprofit that can get money collected because we get money given on a regular basis that that nonprofit can be agile and move to address issues related to quality of life immediately, right? And so there's some things that we're doing that we're just trying some different things, getting the uh, groups involved, nonprofits involved. And look, it might be, let's create a nonprofit in this area to address this specific need. That's why the Hatch Grant was formed. The Hatch Grant was about community. We raised money, we built a bandstand, right? We didn't wanna wait. We, we fought government to get through that process but we we we're gonna do this raise the money and we did it and 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 look money's tight and insurance is high and everything is like that but i tell you one of the things i talk about when i sell terrible and perish is our amazing culture we get together for a good time and raise money and give you the shirt off our back every day all day and maybe it is one little bitty project to touch one life to make an impact that then turn around and it affects the community. And so, again, that's that conversation that says, let's make sure we get in the room, let's have a conversation about what children in what area need some services, and then who all can we partner together to help make that happen? And, and let's do it, right? And, again, I've said it before, it's going to take all of us. Uh, and I'm here to do everything I can to help move Terrible Parish forward. And, look, I say it now. We just turned 200 years old as a parish. With what we have coming on from the state and everything else we got going on right now, we have the opportunity to set the path and go down the journey of our next 200 years. I'm going to need all y'all help because I'm going to need you to help me understand what's missing. I need you to help hold us accountable. And we want to do everything we can to resolve issues and the definition of sanity, not do the same thing over and over again, expect a different result. We're going to do some things differently and try to do some things better to get that different result. So, any other questions? And if you, look, if you wanna talk after, I'm gonna hang around. If you don't wanna be on the mic or on the camera, 
We'll hang around. Make sure you fill out the papers. We want to get all the issues addressed and, and understand, make sure it's in the system and, and get those issues resolved. Again, we got these emergency preparedness. I want to thank Carly, Kim, Dirk, all my directors, everybody, all my employees that came out uh, and all the work, hard work. And if you, get, if you feel like those, those, they're working hard, you mind giving them a round of applause if y'all don't mind? I thank them for their service and what they do every day. And I, I tell you, I got an amazing team. I feel like one of the best teams in the state. And with that team and with passion and with dedication and hard work, we can accomplish anything. And I firmly believe that. And again, I thank you all for coming out. And if there's no other questions, we'll go offline and, and have some other conversations. Oh, you got a question? No? Okay. I thought you raised his hand back there. Okay. Thank you all again for coming. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. Thank you again for your time.